Hello listeners, a warm welcome to Views on Health. A great pleasure, as always, to have a medical specialist on the program. And uh, on the program today, of course, it's um, a very specialized area we're going to focus on. It's on childhood disabilities. It's a huge problem in Sri Lanka, and there are children across the country facing various disabilities, uh, I would think, through no fault of their own. It's something that I think I stand, uh, I could be corrected if um, the consultant who's on the program uh, wants to correct me, certainly yes. But from a lay perspective, we hear of so many disabilities and we see children also with so many uh, issues that uh, they face from the time they are born and maybe going into a particular age or maybe some of them even perhaps may go on for life. Having said that, let me welcome Dr. Dilini Vipulaguna, Consultant, Community and Developmental Pediatrician in the Gampaha District. Thank you so much, Doctor, for coming into our studios in the midst of a busy schedule. We truly appreciate it. So over to you then to enlighten our listeners on childhood disabilities. Thank you so much for having me in this program. And I would say the pleasure is mine uh, because um, identifying that this important topic as, uh, you know, uh, something to be discussed and get our, you know, uh, listeners the, their attention to this because this is something we often overlook. But uh, it is, as you said, it's a quite challenging for somebody who's having disability as well as a family who's having someone with disability. So um, to start the topic, like, we, because I'm a pediatrician and I, I work with children, so my focus is mainly on with children. And uh, what when we call about disability, so uh, there are so many different disabilities we talk about. And most of them, as you said, some children are born with it whereas some actually acquire it later, later on in their lives because of different, different reasons. However, uh, most important things that we need to remember is some disabilities are often visible, like, you know, you don't have a limb or you don't, you know, have some dysmorphism or something like that. Other disabilities are really hidden, and especially the ones related to the mental health and the, the development. So it's it's very important to remember that, you know, the, the people around us have probably very different needs. So it's as probably as a society, it's our duty to make sure that everybody should be included and we should never, you know, let them feel different. So that probably is one thing I'm very happy that I'm here to talk about, about childhood disabilities. Thank you, Doctor, for that uh, um, introduction to uh, our topic of childhood disabilities. Now, having said that, um, some children are born with them and some acquire as they grow. And then, of course, some are visible and some are not. So it's it's a huge, uh, I would think, um, area that your profession is covering. And um, it, if you can tell us step by step uh, the type of uh, disabilities that uh, people, children are born with and then go on to what they can acquire. So, I mean, it really uh, depends on, you know, how we are born. So, you know, when you know you are like implanted in mommy, mother's tummy, um, from that point onwards, the children can start to have disabilities. So what we call from our genes, what we are made of our building blocks. So there are certain children who have, you know, something wrong in their genetic or their genes and then obviously that will come out as a disability when they are born and on the way then with the pregnancy because you know this is not only genes that decides but will come out with the child but also how the environment goes especially when inside mother's tummy again so like what 
the mother eats. That's why we really talk about to have a good nutrition for pregnant ladies. And then we talk about getting their immunization up to date because we want to prevent all the preventable infections. We want to make sure they are correct in their weight and everything. So we insist on all these uh, clinic follow-ups, monitoring. And then uh, still there are children who could catch different infections so like different bugs, viruses, it could be just bacteria that could infect mother and then go to the baby through placenta and these infections can result in disabilities. And we have so many medical illnesses we talk about now. So like starting from diabetes, hypertension and so many other medical disorders that mothers can have. And in turn, they affect how the baby's blood supply, you know, the, the again through placenta. So these things again can change how your brain works or how your systems work. And this can result in a disability. Another important factor is again, you know, you, we have these all the blood vessels and everything and all our systems. So if the baby is inside mother's womb, but there's something obstructing the its, you know, existence, or if there are something like we call there are like bands inside mother's womb. So then the growth will not happen and that will result in like, you know, like an amputation, you know, the baby won't have enough growth or there won't be something wrong with the limbs things like that and most importantly things that mothers take so to begin with different substances smoking alcohol and then to come with the substances like illicit drugs or prescribed drugs uh, so there are like even for mental health illnesses the you are you know, you are required to take some medications, mm -hmm. knowing that not taking the medication would definitely harm the baby. But certain drugs, especially if you don't know you are pregnant and if you've been taking them, can harm baby in different ways. So there's so many different reasons why the child could, how the child could get affected and then it, it would result in uh, a disability. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for that detailed explanation, and uh, I'm sure listeners will find it very interesting, and also especially um, mothers and mothers-to-be will take note of um, what you have shared with us so far on the program. Uh, so that is how it happens from within, and then, um, so unfortunate. How common is this then, Doctor, in the sense that uh, do we uh, have uh, like a vast number of children so affected and if if so uh, I mean the mothers also go to the clinic before they have the baby and uh, most mothers today also uh, go and see their uh, doctor before even they conceive they discuss things with the doctor and uh, say they plan to have a baby and what should they do what sh they shouldn't do so there's a lot of awareness and they are educated despite all of that if you still have a vast number of cases, then uh, how does it happen? I mean, what, what is it that makes this number so large, which is unfortunate? Exactly. But, I mean, very interesting question. So, um, so if, we, if I focus on the first, first uh, point you raised, the number, we talk about, well, very roughly, very r crudely, if we talk about, we talk every poppy, you know, every community would have at least 10% of, you know, children with disabilities under five. And if I be very precise, um, there's been a, like a, uh, we, we don't have exact statistics for Sri Lanka, again, very unfortunately, uh, but there has been um, a kind of a mathematical calculation in, in recent not very recent, but some time ago, about a few years back, an, an international article, and they calculated about only six disabilities. Mind you, this is only very, you know, only six disabilities they counted, and um, they estimated for Sri Lanka about 7,000 children per 100,000 children. So to give you a rough idea, this is um, 
they, they are talking about children less than five years. So where I work, I work for Gampa district and um, our birth cohort looking at how much children we have every year born and we have about 150,000 children uh, less than five years in Gampa district if we take rough numbers. So that means we have about 10,000 children with six named disabilities but that is you as you started the conversation you said there are probably around 20 or more than that so this is we talk about you know in mm. multiplies of uh, you know 10,000 so that's that's a huge um, huge numbers we are talking about um, and then coming back to why why this is caused like you know we, we know we are very careful and stuff so the the one good thing is having improved our maternal services and and even uh, during birth you know there are so many things can happen you know the the labor can get obstructed or you can have you know the baby can lose oxygen for very few seconds which we still can make a you know kind of a difference in the brain um, or they can have difficulties in their feet or they can get yellow after birth then they need you know phototherapy so many things can happen or they can have an infection afterwards after birth so this all these things um, we are actually you know very proudly again saying as a you know low and middle income country in in the region probably we have the best uh, you know perinatal statistics what we mean perinatal is from the pregnancy after you know several months of birth so we have very good statistics. So we've tried to prevent as much as possible the preventable things, you know, making sure mothers are, you know, getting vaccinated, getting their weight checked, getting their nutrition, maximizing their mental health. So everything we, we are trying to do, public health sector has been doing. Um, but, you know, even so, there are a number of children who are born with, especially when we can't modify the genetics. So that's why even, you know, things like autism spectrum, so many developed countries still are struggling to work how, because nothing in the, uh, nothing in the uh, maternal, you know, pregnancy period, there's no one intervention that they can do to prevent autism. So, you know, th that is like that. So there are certain disabilities that would, um, the numbers are increasing, particularly in the Western world, and you know, even autism, we don't have numbers. Um, and even in a in a very um, probably not ironically, but you know, in a very um, interesting way, because we survived so many young children who would not have survived in past um, in the in the past. Like you know, we are now surviving about twenty three weeks. Usually, a child would born at forty weeks, where we are kind of surviving uh, 23, 24, you know, twenty seven eight weeks. But because they are born very early, too soon, there are so many disabilities they could come out later in life so that is one you know again advance in the, the medicine has resulted in these effects having said that I'm not saying that's not a good thing mm -hmm. so we are as a nation should be focused on minimizing not only their survival but also to make sure they don't have a disability in the future. Um, is this uh, anything to do with the gender of the child I mean would you say that there are more boys who present with these issues or more girls or it's nothing to do with the gender? Uh, certain disabilities, certain, uh, we we'll say, certain disabilities, if you take, look at the epidemiology or the numbers, there are, of course, the gender difference, more boys are affected. But that is, you can't really generalize it for disability overall. But there are definitely certain disabilities that, you know, when you look at the data, you can see the boys are predominant uh, because of certain like genetic component or you know there are different uh, factors playing on but uh, overall disability you can uh, never say a gender predominance. Now if you take the physical disabilities uh, are there ways of correcting them? Uh, sometimes certain uh, disabilities are treated by through surgery and they are put right. Sometimes no it's not possible and the child has to live with it and grow into adulthood in this with uh, you know carrying that uh, uh, disability with him or her but then we also find that uh, just digressing for a moment that today 
society as we see it is very understanding and very helpful. Uh, so they, they, they are part of society and they don't feel left out. So could you tell us what, what are the sort of um, uh, disabilities that could be portrayed, the physical ones? Yeah, so um, one thing probably, uh, I mean, as uh, somebody who, who work with children with disabilities, we would really like, uh, there are, as you said, certain percentage, certain number of children whom we can actually correct the disability, you know, um, where you can do just a surgery or, you know, um, if the child has a visual impairment, you know, they can't see properly. There are things that could be done, you know, by the eye surgeons mm -hmm. to correct it. If the child cannot hear, there are cochlear implants now that they, you can just let them hear. So there are certain disabilities that completely could be reversed. However, having said that, um, the, the attitudes and, and the, the, the framework now in the world is always um, making sure that uh, the people or the families or the society not to focus on that particular disability but to make sure the overall uh, picture so that you even you might not, you know, so, for instance, if a child is born in a very different socioeconomic situation, they might not have all the options available in the world to reverse that situation in that particular area. So, the, 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 the final fact is that you are looking at the child and the family as an overall picture, making sure that you try to optimize the function, so they try to do the function, you make sure that they can participate in the society or the social life, but making sure that you might not always can reverse the disability, but yes, definitely there are certain, particularly physical ones, that could be reversed very easily. What about those that are not visible? You said that at the outset. Yes, so that's that's the probably what I was focusing more. I we would like to focus more. Um, one thing is because um, why they are hidden in a way is stigma. So like people don't want to come out with it, especially if their child has a developmental problem or if their child has a, a mental health problem. So uh, people are really scared of it, and uh, people don't like to come out with it so they try to hide it and you know which should not be and and I think that's why as a society we should be more receptive about this um, it's very difficult to reverse certain things when we talk about hidden disabilities because what we talk about is a human brain which is more complex than you know most complex computer in on earth so it's it's uh, you have not found a way how to reverse when something has happened to brain. What we try to do always as developmental pediatricians, minimize the damage, try to reverse whatever it is, but nobody has achieved 100%. So that's why we always encourage, try to maximize what you can do, not actually focusing on the disability. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, help that child to develop as best as possible along with whatever that child has to unfortunately carry with him or her. Yeah, so um, that probably would be a good time for me to bring in most important concept when we talk about childhood disabilities. So World Health Organization, they introduced something called um, ICF or International Classification for Disability Functioning um, and Health. So this, they, they focus on how somebody should look at a disability. And they talk about, you know, for instance, when, as you said earlier, about a limb. Now, if you talk, think about a child who's not having a limb or a child who cannot walk even. In the past, we used to look at only that limb. Okay, this is the problem, so we'll just, you know, kind of cure it or we'll try to manage it. So this is called the body structure or the function of that person. Earlier, we were just trying to look at that. But they realize if you just try to only focus on that, that might really not improve the, the person's or family's quality of life because 
what really matters, what activity that person can do, what functions that they can do. So if you only kind of give a medication or do a surgery only for that limb, but not looking at what activity they can do, like the very, very common example I always take. Just imagine a child who cannot walk because of some sort of a disability. And then you come, they come to your clinic, you just give the medication, which, you know, should be able to improve their leg functions. And then uh, you send them home. But what if that child cannot really climb stairs? And then if you don't look at what activity they cannot do, you have not done their job. And imagine, furthermore, that child's classroom is in the first floor. If you had not looked at the participation of the child, that child probably not going to school because of that. So that's why we really focus on not only the looking at that particular body structure, but make sure you are looking at the activity and try to make sure that you improve it. So, you know, you give a railing to the child so he can climb stairs holding onto that railing. Or you try to bring the classroom downstairs so he can go to school. So that's the kind of the overall picture I was talking about. It's very interesting and so important, Doctor, that uh, the focus now has switched, if I may put it that way, uh, to the overall well-being of the child. And, and the family. And exactly, going from there, yes, I'm sure. So, so the family does play an important role in this entire exercise. Yes, yes, so much. They so, have to. Um, I mean, in both ways. So like... Um, the, again, going back to that ICF framework, um, the factors they talk about to make sure that everything is happening is something called personal factors. So like, you know, what the child could do, mm -hmm. how much they, how resilient they are, or what are the, you know, the talents they have, mm -hmm. and the environment. So environment means the family, the society, the country, policies, everything, infrastructure, even the accessibility is a, is a kind of an environment. So the family, when the child is very small, Everything we do is really going through the family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one very important um, factor or principle we do is all our interventions are family-centered because that is where, the, you know, the, the child lives. And everything we do, we try to train the family to do, go and do it in their home environment. Because imagine a child, we are trying to kind of improve their language or, you know, somebody who's not talking, we try to make sure that they talk. Now, if they come to hospital for speech therapy, how frequently do you think they need to come? They can't come every day. They can't come every hour. But who's talking at home? They have 24-7. They are at home. So what we do, the principal in the current, you know, the, the, the clinical practice, we train the families and they are the therapists. So everything happens in family and that's why it's family-centered. And the other thing is... If you have experience when you're visiting a doctor, so if you go with your complaint and doctor writes something, they just give it to you and that's it. Probably you probably might not know what you've been prescribed. Whereas in disability, we can't do that because um, the family is the deciding point. So imagine a child comes to you who's not walking and you want to make them walk. But if family says, no, but we really want to make him train for going to toilet. So we really focus on what family wants rather than what we want because it's ultimately the family that's matter because that's where the child is going to live and that's where the, the whole uh, structure is there in the society. So that, that is probably that's why we are very different from you know the, 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 that perspective. Very interesting, Doctor, that uh, it's, it's uh, amazing that uh, so many uh, important areas that were not looked into in the past and now have uh, been taken into consideration, focused on, and actually brought to the fore, so to speak. Yes. So that um, it's, a, it's a combined effort, right? The, the family, uh, the, the doctor, the medical professionals. Yes. What about the child? How do you motivate the child to do certain things? <laughs> so um, may not be easy. Uh, yes, uh, but but again, it's easy in a other you know in a, in a way it's easy uh, because um, I mean more, most common questions parents ask is when they come to us, especially young children. Is um, after about two three sessions they ask, is that all you do? Because what we always ask parents to do is play. 
because that's the only way you can get the child to do things. Most of our things, most of our interventions are play-based because that's the only thing that children know to do by the time, you know, they are very young. So um, if you want to improve their speech, well, play and talk to child. If you want to let them walk, okay, play and let them walk. So that's how everything is there. So in a way, it's a bit difficult because if, it is adult, if you want to improve, you know, their hand function, you just ask them to do these exercises and they will do it. Uh, but for a child, it's very tricky. You can't ask them to do, you know, these seven push-ups or like that. So you play with them and to make sure that you get whatever you want to play. Um, in a way, it's difficult, but in a way, it's easy because children like to play. And also, it, it kind of helps the family bond. So, you know, the, we, we, that's why we really encourage parents to be there together and, you know, be as a family unit and do everything. And, and it's, again, it's not like going to gym or going to a hospital and do therapy because it's in, incorporated into your fam day to day family life, you know. If you want child to um, be there in the kitchen, well, be there in the kitchen and do the same activity or in the bath, do the same activity. So there's nothing, you know, new. It's just in your daily routine, but you just do whatever you want through play. And actually, uh, the focus then is on what the child wants to do, is it? Well, we usually focus on a goal, as I said, uh, whatever we want to do with the family's agreement. So like as I said, if family wants toilet training, yes, we focus on that. But we usually try to get the child lead the way, but we always augment. Mm. So we just make it towards what we want without, you know, letting the child get more upset. Uh, thank you, Doctor. The time has caught up with us. And it's been so interesting speaking with you on uh, childhood disabilities. And um, what would be your uh, final message to our listeners? Yeah, probably as I think uh, a society and, and parents, families, we, one thing we should remember is it's a very common thing. And there's no reason why we should discriminate people or children with disabilities. So make sure that um, the most important thing, you should not sympathize them but you should include them into your, particularly your families, your society, even like education and leisure, make sure that they are included. Thank you, Doctor. And on that note of advice, we end this very interesting discussion on childhood disabilities. We thank you very sincerely, Dr. Dilini Bipulaguna, consultant, community and developmental pediatrician, in the Gampa district, covering a large area, I can see. Thank you so much, Doctor, for coming to our studios in the midst of your busy schedule and to speak to our listeners on this very important topic. We look forward to your presence on the program. Thank you so much. Next week as well, because I'm sure something interesting to share with our listeners. Definitely. Thank Thanks. you, Doctor. And on that note, we end this program. My thanks also go to Nadi Raman and Perry for technical assistance. I'm Fatima Razi Kader saying good night. And looking forward to your company next Monday, same time on Views on Health. <laughs>